Well, we're 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 going to we're going to change the order a little bit to accommodate the um, the, the uh, transfer of slides or the lack of transfer of slides to the AV system. So we're going to start with the Dr. Deepak Ptolemyo, who's going to talk to us about um, uh, hybrid techniques for the management of uh, aortic aneurysms. Dr. Deepak Ptolemyo, thank you. Good morning. Dear colleagues, I would like to thank the society for the kind invitation. It's a privilege for me to speak and to present this talk, Hybrid Technique for the Management of Aortic Aneurysm. Open, open surgery remains the gold standard in the treatment of the disease of the thoracic aorta with good results in terms of mortality and morbidity. However, the results are unsatisfactory in high-risk patients and also in complex aortic disease. High-risk patients are patients with severe associated comorbidity, frail and old age, in whom Cardiopulmonary bypass and circulatory arrest can cause the, these potential complications. Moreover, there are many patients with complex aortic disease. What do you mean when you say complex aortic disease? They are the pathologies of the aorta, starting from the ascending aorta or aortic arch and extending downward into the descending thoracic or thoracodominal aorta. They may be acute or chronic. Here, some interesting cases, chronic dissection, multiple aortic ulcers, atherosclerotic chronic aneurysm of the old thoracic aorta. With the advent of endovascular surgery have been developed new surgical techniques defined as hybrid, consisting in the association of open and endovascular surgery. These techniques are namely as the branching and the frozen elephant trunk. The branching. What does arch the branching mean? Translocation of one, two or three supraortic vessels for landing zone extensions. In some cases, the proximal landing zone is located in the ascending aorta and can be required also the replacement of this aortic portion. Endovascular standing can be performed during the same time or in the second stage. When the procedure is performed during the same time, the stand delivery can be undergrade, as you can see in the picture or retrograde. In these cases, the delivery of the stand graph is performed in retrograde fashion. The results of the debranging are satisfactory, taking in mind that we have treated complex and high-risk patients. The perioperative mortality is around 10%, stroke between 0 to 14-20%. However, I would like to emphasize the important rate of endolic requiring generally a new endovascular procedure and in some cases even open surgery associated with high mortality and morbidity. In patients with complex aortic disease, in 1983, a two-step approach, the elephant trunk procedure was described by Borst this approach facilitates the construction of the distal anastomosis during the initial operation. And in second stage, it avoids hazardous dissection of the distal aortic arch and facilitates the prosthesis to prosthesis anastomosis. These are the results of the elephant trunk technique. 
the overall mortality at first stage is 8.9%, with only the 46% of the patients who underwent and the second stage of the operation. At the second stage, the mortality rate is 7.7%. Along with the advent of transfemoral stand grafts for the treatment of the descending aortic aneurysm, it became possible to securely ensure a stand graft in elephant trunk prosthesis, previously placed during arch surgery. Here, an endovascular second stage is shown. In this table are reported some experience of endovascular completion after previously conventional elephant trunk technique. The total mortality of endovascular second stage is 4.4%, significantly lower compared with the 7.7% 7, 7 of mortality of a surgical second stage previously showed. The most recent development of the classic elephant trunk technique is the combination of an endovascular stand graft with the conventional surgical graft for hybrid procedures for the treatment of the ascending, the arch, and the descending thoracic aorta. This new option was termed frozen elephant trunk. The new device is composite of a proximal part consisting of a vascular prosthesis with zero porosity and a distal part of self-expendable nitinol stand graft. This is the last hybrid device recently introduced in the market. This kind of operation are very complex and time demanding. Key points during this surgery are represented by an accurate assessment of the aortic anatomy, the employment of reliable methods of organ protection, and with effective surgical technique and strategies. The interior aorta has to be carefully investigated before operation, especially in case of acute or chronic dissection where it is mandatory to know the origin of the visceral arterias, true or false lumen, and the presence of the distal reentricitis. The usual recommendation is no oversize the stand. Also, in chronic aortic aneurysm, it is very important to know the exact diameters of the descending thoracic aorta in order to decide the correct size of the stand graft. In this case, the oversizing is indicated. As a method of a cerebral protection, we use the undergrade selective cerebral perfusion proposed by Professor Kazui with a bilateral cerebral perfusion and a moderate systemic hypothermia. In order to protect the abdominal organs and the spinal cord, when the distal anastomosis is performed, we reperfuse the thoracoabdominal aorta through the graft for 10-15 minutes at the full flow at the same temperature of the cerebral perfusate. This maneuver is also used to verify that there is no leakage in the distal anastomosis. <coughs> Now, I would like to show you our technique for the Evita implantation. After the paralyzation, we introduce a stiff guide wire from the femoral artery. At 26 uh, temperatures, after clamping the proximal indominate artery, the anti-grid brain perfusion is performed through the cannulation of the right axillary artery, the left common carotid artery, and when it's possible, of the left subclavian artery in order to guarantee a more physiologic cerebral circulation. In case of acute and chronic aortic dissection, excuse me, 
in, in case of acute or chronic aortic dissection, after the interruption of a cardiopulmonary bypass, the proximal descending aorta is prepared using an external Teflon felt fixed with some, usually four, internal pledged U stitches. The stand graft system is introduced in undergrade fashion in the descending aorta over the previously positioned stiff guide wire and release it with a pullback system. Then the stand graft is sutured to the previously prepared descending aorta. And after the incorporated decron graft is pulled back. A 10 minute lower body reperfusion is then achieved, while hemostasis and the preparation of the highland containing the arch vessels are performed. The arch vessels are reimplanted using the highland or alternatively the separated graft technique. The most interesting finding we found was the also in some cases of a chronic dissection, the healing of the aorta can be achieved with the complete thrombosis and the shrinkage of the entire thoracic false lumen. This is our experience with the Evita, including complete follow-up. From January 2007 to February 2013, we operated on 130 patients. Now, I will show you the result obtained with the frozen elephant rank in the treatment of complex lesions of the thoracic aorta presented by the International IVITA Open Registry. It is a multi sender registry in which we routinely insert our data from 2008. Between January 2005 and June 2012, the data of 363 patients was collected in the International Evita Open Registry. 249 patients had aortic dissection, 120 acute and 129 chronic. 114 were thoracic aortic aneurysm. The mean age was 61 for acute aortic dissections, 60 for chronic dissection, while the patient with chronic aneurysm were older with a mean age of 69. The main comorbidities were aortic valve insufficiency, coronary artery disease, ejection fraction lower than 40%, chronic renal insufficiency and chronic pulmonary disease, very bad patients. 65% of the patients received a previous cardiovascular operation. Additional procedures were bendal operation, aortic valve sparing procedure, isolated valve replacement, and coronary artery bypass grafting. The operative times confirm that they are very long and complex operation and the results obtained are satisfactory. We have had a total in hospital mortality of 16%, with only 18% only of in hospital mortality in case of acute dissection. These are the postoperative complications. The postoperative neurological events were low, as you can see, we have had 6% of stroke and 7% of a spinal cord injury. The rate of a paraplegia was 4% both for acute and chronic aortic dissection and chronic aneurysm, and 5% in case of a chronic aortic dissection. The two-year survival rate was almost 7%. 86% in chronic aneurysm, 80% in acute aortic dissection, and 85% in chronic dissection, as you can clearly see from the curves. 
In acute aortic dissection, the 97% of the patient had no need of second aortic surgery, while for chronic aneurysm and chronic dissection, the rate of freedom of a second aortic surgery was 81% and 91% respectively. As regards the freedoms of a second EVR, it was 87, 69 and uh, 85% respectively for acute chronic dissection and chronic aneurysm. In conclusion, classic open surgery in high-risk patients, old, severe comorbidity, complex heart disease, has unsatisfactory results. Hybrid treatment has been introduced to improve outcomes. Aortic arch debranching can be used in high-risk patients, but it's associated with non-negligible mortality and morbidity. Various techniques are available for the treatment of a complex disease of the thoracic aorta. Frozen elephant trunk represents a feasible and efficient option. Satisfactory rate of mid-term survival, freedom of a second aortic surgery, freedom of a second EVR, long-term follow-up is warranted. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Di Portolomeo for his excellent presentation. And uh, Dr. Cooper will present Dr. Uh, Di Portolomeo with a present to show our gratitude and appreciation for his outstanding presentation. Thank you. Scaro, who's going to talk to us about the spectrum of uh, aortic aneurysm surgery. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the society for the uh, invitation to present here um, our experience. And uh, although the uh, because of the changes in the, uh, in the talks, there will be uh, some overlap probably uh, with the uh, presentation of uh, uh, Dr. Di Bartolomeo. What I'm going to talk about is about results uh, in the management of aortic uh, diseases with hybrid technique, but I'm going to concentrate in, uh, uh, a little bit more in uh, the most uh, recent uh, graph that has been introduced, uh, which is the Toraflex graph. Uh, to start with, uh, initially, um, I just would like to remind that the strategies for treatment uh, of uh, uh, combined diseases of the aortic arch and, and, and descending uh, aorta has uh, changed over time. And um, there is, uh, don't think, okay, um, it's being proposed a two-stage uh, technique, elephant trunk procedure, as uh, has been uh, uh, proposed for a time with a, uh, with a conventional uh, so-called also floating or fresh uh, trunk, uh, which is a technique developed by uh, uh, Professor Borst in, in Germany. Uh, this has been followed by the uh, alternative of a single stage uh, technique where the whole of the aorta is approached and uh, replaced in one, uh, in one stage via clamshell uh, incision or sternotomy plus a, uh, a left thoracotomy. The frozen elephant trunk technique also uh, called uh, as a hybrid procedure and the aortic uh, debranching of the, uh, of the arch plus endovascular stenting. So all of this are, is our armamentarium with the, which we can address the um, uh, diseases, especially of the aortic arch and the, the descending uh, aorta. Again, uh, showing somehow the evolution of, uh, of how the, 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 uh, the treatment of the aortic disease has uh, evolved in time uh, from a first stage 
has uh, then was followed to a two-stage uh, approach. And now again, with the advent of the uh, uh, frozen uh, elephant trunk technique, again, uh, one stage uh, procedure has been uh, proposed. The frozen elephant trunk procedure is, uh, uh, uses a stented uh, section uh, of a, a, a graft. This potentially allows the procedure to be carried out in one stage, depending on the extent of the disease and, the, and in the descending aorta. Uh, the, main, uh, the main issue what needs to be considered is that extensive aneurysms involving the thoracic aorta and the abdominal uh, aorta may need following uh, the first stage, which is the deployment of the frozen trunk, a second stage for either further stenting or open surgery uh, to address the rest of the, uh, of the aorta. The philosophy behind uh, uh, all of this is that by reducing the, uh, uh, the time of the uh, procedure and preventing the need of, for subsequent uh, procedure, uh, the method could greatly improve the success uh, of the repair by reducing morbidity and mortality uh, in the patients. In essence, uh, the frozen elephant trunk, as uh, uh, pro, uh, Dr. Di Bartolomeo has al already shown, uh, implies the deployment of a uh, stent in the uh, thoracic uh, in the thoracic aorta followed by a, um, is that a pointer? Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. Uh, followed by the um, pulling out of the, a, a, uh, the, 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 the non-stented uh, portion of the, uh, uh, of, or, or, or of, the of the device to uh, complete uh, the repair of the arch and then the suture of the epiaortic vessels uh, to it. And this is the, 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 the uh, main uh, principle. And we can very well imagine that when we see images uh, like this uh, and we sit in front of the, uh, of the screen looking at the CT scan and we, and, and, and we think, well, how, how are we going to repair this? If we go from the front, we're not going to be able to repair the whole aorta. If we go from the side, we, from, the, from the chest, we're not going to repair it uh, either. Whether if we use uh, one of these uh, devices, we can um, uh, achieve a full repair of the arch and uh, a good seal uh, beyond the, uh, where the aneurysm is in the uh, descending aorta. Again, in a very similar situation, preoperatively, we find this huge, large uh, aneurysm involving the distal, uh, the distal arch and the proximal descending thoracic aorta, and following, uh, following repair, it has been a frank reduction of the uh, aneurysm, and we have uh, restored uh, anatomy. Um, as, we, uh, as we heard already, two devices are available in, uh, in Europe. One is the uh, Evita uh, open graft, from which you've seen uh, a better picture uh, than this from uh, Dr. Di Bartolomeo. And the uh, other uh, graft is the uh, recently introduced Toraflex, which uh, is probably a shorter uh, graft is, is, is quite user-friendly in, uh, in the operating uh, room when you are uh, uh, trying to do these procedures. Uh, the Toraflex uh, graft comprises a, a rigid portion, which is the stent, a collar for the, uh, um, uh, to perform the distal anastomosis, a branch to perfuse the body when uh, the, 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 the distal anastomosis has already uh, been uh, performed, and then three branches to uh, anastomose the epiaortic vessels, left subclavian, left carotid, and the innominate artery. Um, the data available in, uh, uh, from uh, uh, the, the uh, different series 
doesn't include so many pa that doesn't include so many patients, and uh, it is not since the uh, opening of the international registry that uh, we have been collecting more consistent uh, data in the use of these uh, devices. Dr. Di Bartolomeo has uh, already spoken about the uh, uh, international uh, registry, and I'm not going to um, uh, say very much about the, 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 the Evita Open registry, uh, except probably that at the moment more than 400 implants have uh, uh, taken uh, place uh, with good results. To highlight uh, with the Evita and, and, and the experience is that in 93% of cases, acute or chronic dissection, it has been thrombosis, has been achieved thrombosis of the false lumen and in what relates to thoracic aortic aneurysm, in 77% of the cases it has been full exclusion of the aneurysm in just one single procedure. Um, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital introduced uh, already some time ago the technique of uh, the frozen elephant trunk initially uh, with the Evita open uh, device and now recently since uh, December uh, the use of the Toraflex, uh, the Toraflex device. Our experience with the uh, Evita device is uh, shown here uh, per year. Uh, this includes 28 patients. Nowadays we have performed 33 uh, implants with the uh, Evita uh, uh, device. The distribution between um, uh, indications is uh, 18 patients have, been, uh, have received the Evita device for uh, aneurysms of the uh, aortic arch and, uh, descend and proximal descending or uh, descending thoracic aorta, and 10 patients uh, for aortic dissections, uh, acute and uh, uh, chronic. Um, a total of uh, three patients uh, have received the, 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 the implant in type A aortic dissections, three chronic, one, uh, one acute aortic dissection, and seven patients for type B aortic dissections. Uh, the uh, situation of the uh, intimal flap was only in the ascending aorta uh, in one patient, uh, uh, flap extending to the arch and the uh, descending thoracic aorta in two patients, and flap in the arch descending thoracic aorta in seven patients. The, the, the maximum diameter of this uh, in, in these situations was 53.6 uh, millimeters. Uh, in case of uh, an aneurysms, uh, urgent operations, only one patient, 6% of the series, urgent in two patients, and most of, the, of our series uh, comprises elective patients, uh, if, uh, 15 patients, which is 83% uh, of the uh, uh, of our numbers. Um, the the ascending aorta arch and uh, descending thoracic aorta was involved in in, in 10 cases, whether uh, the arch and the descending thoracic aorta only was involved in eight patients. the distribution of, uh, of uh, cases and data on the, on the patients, mainly to show that in, in dissections, probably the age is slightly, slightly younger patients, probably with some less comorbidities than in the most uh, chronic and aneurysmatic uh, patients. The operative strategy, I think the operative strategy is more or less uh, quite standard and, uh, and, 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 and internationally uh, practiced. Uh, we use cardiopulmonary bypass, hypothermia. Initially, we were using 15 degrees of hypothermia, and this is because we were running a, uh, a, another trial at the time. Uh, currently, we use hypothermia to 22 uh, uh, degrees. Total arch replacement with reimplantation of the supraortic vessels. We use circulatory arrest in all patients with deep hypothermia and the cerebral uh, selective anti cerebral perfusion 
uh, in, uh, in 27 of the patients. In one patient, we used uh, moderate hypothermia, and that was, uh, it was a Jehovah's Witness, and we wanted to uh, minimize blood loss and all the uh, derangements of uh, coagulation that comes along with uh, this type of uh, operation. Uh, the uh, Evita open graft was introduced in the descending aorta with a guide wire previously inserted from the femoral artery to, be, uh, uh, to, to ensure in those cases with aortic dissections that we are in the true lumen and we, not, we won't be deploying the stent in the false lumen. Recently, with the Toraflex technique, uh, we have implanted all the patients, uh, all the, all, all the uh, devices, integrately without uh, the need of, uh, of wire. Um, Intraoperative data, uh, I don't think this is, uh, is, is uh, much to say about, uh, about it. In uh, uh, terms of, re of results, uh, our mortality uh, includes, uh, for the Evita, uh, patients include 14% uh, in total, two patients uh, belong to the group of aneurysms and two patients to uh, the, the, the group of uh, uh, dissections. The uh, causes of, of death are uh, mentioned uh, down here. Uh, not winning from, uh, from, from, from bypass, that was an aortic dissection, patient was uh, uh, with a long operation and, 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 and bleeding from uh, everywhere. Um, low cardiac output syndrome in, two case, in, in, in one case, sepsis in, in one case, and then stroke again in another case. Those are the four uh, cases that have uh, uh, perished. Postoperatively, uh, all these patients, we know they, they, they go through a, a process, a long process of, uh, uh, of recovery where they may uh, develop a number of uh, uh, complications. Um, I think it's very important to highlight that one of the uh, most fear, uh, one of the most fear complications and, and, and probably disastrous complication in this type of uh, surgery is the appearance of spinal cord injury. Um, we haven't seen any uh, uh, spinal cord injury in, in our Syria. Early outcomes, successful aortic aneurysms have been excluded in 16 patients. In two cases, uh, the aneurysm length was uh, longer, th therefore uh, a second stage uh, to cover uh, the rest of the, of the aneurysm is, uh, uh, has been necessary. Uh, two patients had chronic debated type 2 dissection, three patients with debated type 3A dissections uh, limited to the proximal descending thoracic aorta showed complete aortic uh, uh, remodeling following uh, uh, follow-up. Um, and two patients with, the, with type 3B dissections died before the first post-operative uh, CT scan. And in midterms results, we have not seen any uh, endoleaks in, in, in any of the patients. One patient has already undergone uh, a repair of the distal uh, thoracic aorta, and uh, one patient is still awaiting a repair of the, um, of the, um, of the distal thoracic aorta. One patient has died after the uh, operation in the long term, of an unknown cause. The Toraflex uh, system, as I was explaining, has been recently uh, in, introduced. It's a, uh, a system that uh, is uh, provided by uh, uh, Vascutec. This uh, device is uh, currently uh, not commercially available. Um, and uh, the data is uh, at the moment just being uh, uh, collected. In this clip, a uh, quick description of how the uh, uh, device is uh, deployed. It will take a couple of minutes. Do I have more time? Yeah? Okay. 
In this case, there is a wire that has been introduced from the femoral uh, artery, but that's not necessary. This is the device that uh, comes uh, mounted in a flexible, uh, on a flexible wire that can be a mold to the shape can be shaped to the uh, uh, to the aorta, which makes the deployment uh, quite easy. And the deployment is uh, it takes uh, uh, three parts. One is the uh, uh, deployment of the of the stent, which is by pulling this uh, handle here. The second step releases the most proximal part of the, uh, of, the, of the stent and opens the collar for the anastomosis. And then the third step is the final deployment of uh, the very distal end of the, uh, of the graft. All the system is, uh, is uh, withdrawn, taken out, and the anastomosis is then performed. That's the distal anastomosis here, and then the, uh, the, the arch can be uh, reconstructed. Uh, this is in one of, uh, one of our cases. That's what the uh, device uh, looks like. It's being introduced in the, uh, um, the descending thoracic aorta already. That's the... Uh, uh, wire coming out, the anastomosis of the, uh, the, the distal anastomosis has been uh, uh, performed. It is quite uh, easy with the collar uh, to achieve good hemostasis. And uh, finally, the epiaortic vessels uh, innominate left carotid and behind there the uh, uh, subclavian artery has been uh, uh, has been uh, reconstructed, and this arm here is the uh, anti-flow arm for body perfusion, uh, which we start as soon as we uh, as soon as the uh, anastomosis to the left carotid is done, uh, we clamp here and we start reperfusing the patient. Um, in terms of uh, worldwide experience, the, uh, the, the Toraflex system uh, was um, uh, initially uh, started implantation in Hanover, and, and the data that we have at the moment is, uh, is the one that, 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 that uh, uh, belongs uh, uh, to them. Uh, at, uh, you, uh, at Queen Elizabeth Hospital, we have uh, implanted uh, four uh, of these uh, uh, devices, uh, 30, I think this may be wrong, th th 34, I think, uh, cases were uh, done before uh, the, uh, the, the ob uh, obtention of CE marking, uh, and further 30 cases, uh, I was told this morning that 32 cases have been implanted now worldwide over uh, five centers in, uh, in Europe. And the registry has come live only in uh, the last month. Um, from the 34 cases in, uh, implanted before the CE marking in, uh, in, in, in Hanover, um, this is the age distribution, um, uh, ascending aortic, uh, uh, acute aortic dissection, aneurysms in, in, in 18 cases, chronic aortic dissections to aneurysms 14 uh, 10 have been uh, re-operations. Previous procedures uh, that the patients have had are shown here. Concomitant procedures that the patients have un undergone uh, with the implant of the uh, Toraflex, valve sparing aortic root replacements 12, Bental procedures in four, CABG and mitral valve uh, repair. Um, the, uh, from the point of view of uh, operative technique, is exactly the same, and, and the numbers are very similar as to uh, what is in uh, uh, from from operation from what from the operation we can see. Uh, mortality in this uh, series is only three cases, uh, ten percent. 
Five patients have suffered uh, uh, neurological complications, although these neurological complications were three uh, strokes and uh, two patients to have temporary neurological uh, dysfunction. No patient had suffered of any paraplegia. Uh, two patients required completion of the thoracic uh, aneurysm uh, repair, and another patient uh, required a mitral valve replacement. At, uh, in uh, the Queen Elizabeth, we have a very limited experience, as uh, uh, mentioned already. Uh, the first implant was in December last year. Two male, two females. Chronic dissection was one patient, three aneurysms. Mortality has been 0%. Uh, spinal cord injury, we had one event of, uh, of an uh, embolic uh, uh, event. Patient is not, ha, does not have paraplegia, but does have plegia of uh, one of uh, her legs. Uh, two patients are awaiting the stage, stage two for completion of the uh, repair in the descending thoracic aorta. Uh, again, the worldwide experience included the 34 first cases in, uh, uh, in, in Hanover plus uh, 32 uh, now. In conclusion, the frozen elephant trunk procedure potentially allows a one-stage repair in patients with combined disease of the aortic arch uh, and, and the descending aorta. It offers a secure landing zone for additional endovascular procedures when is necessary. Two devices are currently available. The early results are encouraging. Low mortality, low morbidity, preoperative treatment goals reached in the majority of patients. However, we still uh, need more data. And uh, to finish, I would not be here if it wasn't for this man, Robert Bonser, who taught me everything I know. Thank you. George, th thanks very much. And uh, the final talk in the session then is from uh, Rizwan Atia, who's going to talk us, to us about the science behind the prediction of aneurysm rupture as well. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. They did get your slides for you, did they? Pardon? They did get your slides. Yeah, they did. It's, uh, it's quite a technologically heavy sl um, presentation, so I'm afraid uh, it'll take a while to load up. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, dear members, honored guests. I'll be talking about uh, research which has been published in the last two years or currently in press in terms of aortic aneurysm, uh, science behind prediction of aortic rupture. Now, the talk is really divided into three categories. Firstly, I'll deal with the physiological aspect of things and how aortic pulse wave velocity and aortic stiffness can help us determine aortic behavior. Second part of the talk is discussing functional imaging, notably imaging with uh, PET-CT using FDG, and briefly touch upon new radio label traces which can inform us about aortic wall, and finally talking about magnetic resonance imaging. Now, before we look forward, we have to look at the past and the present, essentially, of how do we currently predict aneurysm rupture, and it all started back in 1966 by Sharon and colleague at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. It was the first time somebody looked at aneurysms and compared aortic diameter to possibly a rupture. Followed three years later by um, Dr. Darling and colleague, colleagues at MassGen in Boston, it was a very elegant study where they looked at autopsies of patients presenting in 1950s and 60s. So they looked at 17,000 cadavers and 200 patients clinically. And it was the first time somebody mentioned or tried to compare what we know now today to be true in abdominal aneurysms, a size above five and a half centimeters correlating to a very high rupture risk. Concomitantly, they also published this as a second table which they describe the constellation of symptoms we know now to be um, textbook regarding how aneurysms present. And they conclude that aneurysmal tenderness in their experience was a single most consistent sign of active or pending leak and back pain commonly produced by gentle pressure on the aneurysm itself, with early operation being the most important factor in survival. Now I would put to you that in the past 45 years, we still haven't moved on from there. And the two criteria we use to tell us about how to treat aneurysm is aortic diameter and the patient's symptoms. So fast forward to 1995, and Yukashi from Japan published a similar kind of analysis 
in ascending arch and proximal descending thoracic aorta where they compared aneurysm diameter <coughs> to aortic expansion. Um, and some of the seminal work came from Yale where Professor Altiradi's group published this paper in 97 where they described this concept of a hinge point and ascending aortic diameter above five and a half centimeter above which there was an exponential rise in complication rate and similarly a diameter of six and a half. So this clearly is to do with wall shear stress and Laplace's law and after a certain point there's an increase in wall tension leading to aortic rupture. The current paradigm however of aortic uh, aneurysm is that the aortic wall is a metabolically active site so there is inflammation with lymphocytes, macrophages and mast cells. They are there in response to an unknown trigger and they damage the smooth muscle cells, which is a key regulator of matrix in the wall, so elastin and collagen. There, thereby, a negative feedback loop is set up, whereupon there is further inflammation, production of strong proteolytic enzymes and pro-inflammatory cytokines, recruitment of antibodies, and damage to the aortic wall. We also now know that this is periadventitial, so there's increased vasovasorum on the outside of the aorta and inflammation progressing inwards towards tunica media. There's a separate island of information apart from this, and we know that smooth muscle cell is a key regulator of the aortic wall. So if you have fibrillin 1 mutations, we get Marfan syndrome. TGF-beta receptor 1 and 2 mutation cause Lewis-Tietz syndrome with aneurysms developing in children. Uh, there are a vast number of other proteins involved, and there are clinical trials ongoing looking at ACE inhibitors and angiotensin 1 blockers, which are known to retard aneurysm growth in patients with Marfan's. If you have neurofibromatosis and NF1 mutation, you get medium-sized arteries become, becoming aneurysmal. And if you have mutations in the SMAD protein, you get a syndrome called uh, aortic aneurysm with osteoarthritis. And of course, if you have alpha smooth muscle actin or myosin uh, heavy chain protein mutations, you get patent ductus arteriosus and presence of an aneurysms and the skin manifestations. And all these proteins interact with each other. And it's likely to think about this is in terms of cancer, that there's a two-hit hypothesis. You're born with a certain predisposition or certain genetic uh, predispositions to or developing aneurysm, and over time you acquire more and more mutations, certain proteins being far more important than others, and how they interact, express, and go on to develop an aortic aneurysm. So if you focus on aortic physiology and aortic pulse wave velocity, the aortic pulse wave is a the time taken for a pulse wave to travel after systole over a specified distance. You can measure this using tonometry or an ultrasound probe. So you can put a probe over the suprasternal notch and look at the aortic arch. You can put a probe at the xiphoid process and look at the abdominal aorta and the femoral artery. And you can map out how the pressure wave is traveling using ultrasound or MRI. So this is a probe which we use. And we do an ECG so we can gate and we can examine the area under the curve to look at the aortic, aortic pulse wave or pressure wave. And similarly, using MR, we can not only get anatomical detail about the aorta and aortic diameter, but we can look at the pulse wave um, and see how this correlates. At the same time as this, we have done CT scans and we have mapped the amount of calcium in the aortic wall, and we know that calcification of the aorta is a measure of aortic stiffness. And the key finding is that the aortic pulse wave velocity goes up in aneurysm patients compared to control measured with ultrasound or MR, doesn't make any difference. And the key finding is that in aneurysm patients, or patients with an abdominal aneurysm, the thoracic pulse of velocity is higher, and this is significantly different. And if we map aneurysm growth using multi-level modeling, so each of these lines is a patient with an aortic aneurysm, we are following with time with serial ultrasound scans, you can see there's a white heterogeneity in the patient's progression with an eventual trend of expansion, and the key message from this work is that the pulse wave velocity correlates extremely well with the odds of developing an aortic aneurysm or aneurysm expansion. It is a stronger predictor than mean arterial pressure or systolic pressure of aortic expansion. So practically speaking in clinics, clinical, pharmacolo clinical pharmacologists are now targeting pulse wave velocity as an endpoint rather than blood pressure for hypertension treatment in aneurysm patients. And we now know that one meter per second increase in pulse wave velocity increases aneurysm expansion rate by up to 19%. So that's something we can do today to predict aneurysm rupture uh, over and above what we have. Next, I'll go and talk about functional imaging. 
using FDG. So FDG is fluorodeoxyglucose. It's a radio-labeled sugar molecule which gets taken up by any rapidly dividing cell, so infection, inflammation, malignancy. And before 2008, there were a small number of retrospective papers looking at patients with aneurysms, and some of them said that there was an increase in uptake in FDG, some of them showed a slower growth, and some of them even correlated rupture to cytometabolic activity. It wasn't clear what this meant. This is a single slice PET scan of Mr. Young's patient it's with Marfan's. So the PET scan shows dark areas which are highly metabolically active, so it's a vertebral column with hematopoiesis. You can just about see a faint outline of the aorta there. We can color code this using computer, and now you can get an intensity of the metabolic uptake as this. I'll refer to these areas as hotspots in the aorta. At the same time, the patient either has a contrast or a non-contrast CT, and you can fuse the two images to get a fused PET CT, and you can see the discrete areas of the aortic wall would light up on FDG imaging. We have done uh, PET CT and MR, which gives us flow velocity data, and using computational fluid dynamics, you can measure wall shear stress at a specific site, and sites of high metabolic uptake correlate with areas of high wall shear stress. So it is possible that there's active remodeling going on in the aorta at that site, and that's why we have a wall shear, wall shear stress which is increasing. This is a fused PET CT fly-through, and this is just to demonstrate that PET has a low spatial resolution of five millimeters, a contrast CT gives you a resolution of 0.6 millimeters, and the liver and the myocardium appear bright because they're highly metabolically active, but as the aorta comes into view, you can see that there is PET signal emanating from certain aortic sites. This allows you to get a three-dimensional map of the aorta um, showing us hotspots. This is a patient with a chronic, type, uh, a chronic aortic dissection, and you can see the flap there. In my mind, the flap just consisted of an inert uh, layer of endothelium and, uh, and smooth muscle cells, but the flap lights up extremely brightly on metabolic imaging. And we have analyzed flap tissue and found that it's an important key mediator of post-dissection aortic expansion. So this data is then fed into another computer program where we can do three-dimensional modeling of the aorta. Each different color on here represents a different uh, metabolic activity in that patient. So we color code the aorta. And based on this data, we generate a three-dimensional map and therefore produce a three-dimensional model of the aorta using laser skintography. So this is one of Mr. Bapat's patients with an ascending aortic aneurysm. We place a mask on the aorta and we mark out or fenestrate points of high metabolic uptake, which you want to biopsy. Similarly, it's an infrarenal aneurysm and you can biopsy discrete sites and compare sites of high versus low metabolic activity. And using flow cytometry, which is a technique, you can look at cell surface markers and you can tell what immune cells are present at sites of aorta, and you can tell if they're lymphocytes, macrophages, or neutrophils. So this is a patient's aorta which macroscopically looks normal. These two sites would look the same and could be next to each other. There's a cell population from an aorta with no PET uptake compared with high PET uptake. And you can visually see that there's a difference there with increased number of T and B lymphocytes, which have been present in the high uptake tissue. And similarly, when we look at the macrophages and NK cells, there is a completely different population of cells present. So metabolic activity correlates to immune cell content in the aorta. And there's a positive linear correlation, which is very strong uh, with lymphocytes and NK cells. Uh, presence of macrophages, but not so with neutrophils. And if you do immunohistochemistry at these sites, the brown staining cells are T cells, which are present in the adventitia. Not very many at sites of low metabolic uptake, but at high metabolic uptake, there's an ingress of these cells into the tunica media, and concomitantly next to the T cells are macrophages. You can see the increased vacuolation of the aorta and progressive neovascularization, so new vessels are growing in the adventitia. If we now look at the extracellular matrix of these sites, so this is a typical histological textbook example of lamellar elastin in the aortic wall with 40 to 55 lamellae. At size of high metabolic uptake, there's complete disorganization of elastin with elastin breakdown. Similarly, the bottom stain shows tropoelastin, which is newly synthesized elastin, which is uncross-linked, and which this is reduced. However, there's upregulation of tropoelastin synthesis. So there's an intense inflammatory infiltrate in the aortic wall, destruction of organized elastin, and there's a remodeling process where the body is trying to lay down more tropoelastin to repair the aorta, but the process probably isn't enough to compensate for the inflammation ongoing. 
This is an APOE model, which is a murine model where the mass is predisposed to getting atherosclerosis. We implant the pump and infuse angiotensin II into these animals, and they get aortic aneurysm, similar to humans. And as you can see, there's discrete focal areas of high metabolic activity. This model allows us to do repeated PET CT scans as often as we like and study what happens to the aorta and compare expansion to metabolic activity. That's what a typical suprarenal aneurysm looks like. These animals develop the same complications as humans, so this is a thoracoabdominal aortic rupture with blood in the hemithorax. That's the abdominal uh, aneurysm with a uh, hemorrhagic change on the surface and thrombus in the, in the actual aneurysm itself. We have looked at aneurysm patients at, uh, throughout the country at 27 centers and compared patients with aneurysm strict controls. And these are the patients who are having a PET CT for another reason um, and looked at the metabolic uptake. What we have found that is that patients with abdominal aortic aneurysms have a lower uptake compared to control patients. And certainly from our data, we know that thoracic aneurysms take up FDG far more than abdominal aneurysms. And it could possibly be that the abdominal aneurysms have a high amount of thrombus, and the signal is lost from the FDG in areas of high thrombus load. This is looking at FDG with patients who've had an aneurysm. So the green dots on this plot are the controls with small aortas. Blue dots are the patients with large aortas compared to metabolic uptake. And as you can see, these patients in green circles are the ones who had a repair, and the red ones are the patients who died. So there doesn't seem to be a correlation between metabolic uptake and clinical outcome from this data. So where does this leave us? Well, we now understand very well that FDG locates to sites of the aortic wall with high metabolic activity. We know what cells are there and what they're doing. However, because we also know that aneurysms grow in fits and spurts, if you take a PET CT, it's like taking a picture of an aorta. It gives you historic, historical information about what was happening in the aortic wall at that time. If you repeat the picture in a week's time, that inflammation might not be there or might be there. And the exposure of radiation to the patient limits its clinical utility in predicting aneurysm expansion. However, there are novel radio-labeled proteins which are now coming online. So this is an example of a normal PET CT where the liver can be seen bright. And this is injecting a radio tra tracer binding to VEGF, so vascular endothelial growth factor. And this precisely locates to a tumor expressing VEGF. So it could be that in the, in the near future, we can take patients' blood sample, extract their MMPs, radio-label them, and inject them back in the patient, and the MMPs will go to sites of uh, high activity, i.e. the aortic aneurysm. And the final bit of the talk, I'll talk about magnetic resonance imaging. This is a, just an example of a Marfan's aortic root in ascending aorta, and this is to demonstrate the, wide, the huge degree of movement which occurs in the aorta, the systole and diastole, but also torsional movement of the aortic root. And we all know this. Now, as well as giving us anatomical data, we can now get flow data. So using phase contrast MRI, we can get flow velocities in the aorta. So this is a patient with a chronic dissection. We can measure the velocity in the true and false lumen. And we can quantify the degree of false lumen thrombosis with time. So this will allow us to predict the degree of false lumen patency, which we know is an important predictor of post-dissection aortic expansion, and predict which false lumens will thrombose. This scan also allows you to visualize the degree of fenestrations between the true and false lumen. So this is a color-coded MRI with a time sequence along the x-axis. Here, the true and false lumen look very similar, but by this sequence, you can see there's a, a change in velocity in the true lumen. And basically, by the final sequence, you can see a fenestration between the true lumen and the false lumen. So it might be that using phase contrast of 4D MRI, we can predict false lumen thrombosis um, and also visualize fenestrations which needs to be covered with endovascular grafting to change uh, aortic false lumen flow. Now we know also that as well as anatomical resolution, MRI is great because it's non-invasive. We know elastin is an abundant protein in aortic wool which is important in aneurysm development. So we have designed a gadolinium bound elastin peptide which our group published two years ago <coughs> which binds specifically to aortic wall. So this is the same model of aneurysm as I was describing before. MRI gives us high spatial resolution in visualizing the aneurysm and seeing where it is. As well as that, can you move forward, please, one slide. It's not going. Um, that's the angiogram, magnetic resonance angiogram. You can see the aorta dilating. 
that's the signal we get from the elastin. So as the aorta expands, we see breaks in the aortic wall where there is elastin loss. By contrast, areas where there is elastin, there's an increase in signal intensity. So the, the, the thing which we think is happening is that there's a remodeling process ongoing in the aortic wall with increased elastin synthesis, and this is tropoelastin. However, this is not enough. And as the aneurysm continues to expand, we have a complete loss of elastin, and these aneurysms go on to rupture. This is what the scan looks like. Not only can we visualize the elastin, we can measure the intensity by using something called the T1 relaxation time. So we can get a numerical value to the strength of the aortic wall. We could tell if you have a T1 relaxation time of above a certain value, there's enough elastin in the vessel wall, and below a certain level, or to a certain threshold, such as here, the aorta is likely to further expand and rupture. Now I'm going to talk about something completely different and bring it back to the MRI, and that's genes. And we know that DNA gets transcribed to RNA in the cytosol, it's processed to messenger RNA, and gets translated to protein. And when I met medical school, I, um, I got taught that 30% of our 30,000 genes um, code for something, us, and 70% are just introns and exons, non-coding non sequences, junk, essentially. However, it's turned out that that 70% codes for this, which is microRNA. And these are small protein sequences present in the cytoplasm, which silence messenger RNA. So these protein sequences are coded by the nuclear genes, but affect messenger RNA. These were discovered in 2000, and since then they have been found circulating in conjunction with platelets, and there is multi-billion pound research at the minute looking at these as a potential biomarker in patients with aneurysmal disease. There are 120 microRNAs, and they all interact with each other. So this is a simplified diagram of, the, of this microRNA network. So each protein talks to another protein, which in turn talks to many other proteins. And if you look at a single component of this separately, that's what it looks like. And our hope is that by changing a single microRNA protein, we change the shape of this network. And if you can change the shape of the network, you can get the cell to produce new proteins that it wasn't coding for before. So this is a smooth muscle cell wanting to make tropoelastin. It makes messenger RNA, which get, makes tropoelastin protein. It's cross-links to cross stable protein for elastic fibers. Normally, the microRNA silences the messenger RNA, so it stops tropoelastin production. What we have done is made an antagomer or an inhibitor of the inhibitor. So by inhibiting the microRNA, we take this out of the equation, and the messenger RNA can be translated to tropoelastin protein. So when we do this in our aneurysm model and image it using the MRI tracer that I described, the antagomer to 29B seems to change aortic diameter. So we can retard aneurysm growth in our model. We can't stop it yet. And it might be there's a washout of the antagomer. And you can see these changes in the murine aortic wall with the elastin loss eventually, along with the collagen, which is blue in this, and destruction of the aortic wall. And it might be by changing the microRNA signature, we can change smooth muscle capacity to make elastin. So to summarize, the phase contrast MRI can help us predict flow velocity and determine the degree of fenestrations in chronic dissections. The elastin tracer is going through FDA approval now, and clinical trials will begin in six months' time uh, for its use in humans. We have also got a new tropoelastin tracer, which we, could, we are currently testing. And there are tracers for collagen and superoxide particles, which locate to macrophages, uh, which are in the early preclinical stage in the States. MRI not only gives us soft tissue anatomy, it can give us flow velocity data to inform us about hemodynamics. And now, for the first time, it can give us metabolic information by having bespoke tracers which target processes in the aortic wall. So to conclude, aortic pulse width velocity is an important predictor of aortic expansion, and it's now clinically being used. We better understand what FDG uptake means in aortic wall. However, it's likely to be not of great clinical utility in the near future. However, phase contrast MRI imaging and novel MR tracers are likely to prove beneficial in, in, in the present and near future. 
and the future is essentially genetic profiling. I haven't spoken much about this, but basically a gene chip array. So everyone, every child which is born has a gene chip to look at the mutations at the present, and every 10 years you have a gene chip array to see which mutations you've acquired, putting you at a high-risk group and therefore further screening. We better understand how these genes code to microRNA signatures by altering the microRNA. We change the protein expression by smooth muscle cells to make more elastin, and the future imaging is what's a PET MR hybrid scanner, which is uh, coming online now. So not only you can do the MR and use the MR tracers, you can do radio labeled PET tracers at the same time. So it's a one shop stop scan, which gives you all the information which you need rather than separate scans. I would like to finally thank the huge group of people who are involved in any of this kind of work, especially my supervisors um, and collaborators, and also the students and postdocs uh, who did the work at the unit. I'll be happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. Please, one, thank you very much. That was a fascinating, fascinating, um, fascinating talk. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, if people have them, if they'd like to stick their hand up, we've got a microphone um, that we'll pass to you to enable you to hear, and please ask, let us know who you're addressing the question to. If I, if I might start, Dr. D. Bartolomeo, are there any patients in whom you would not consider <coughs> using a, um, the hybrid technique with an Avita Plus that you described, and in, in whom you would prefer um, a, a traditional two-stage surgical procedure? Generally, in the old patient, when the patient uh, is not indicated for the surgery, is the patient uh, with um, many, many comorbidities. In other case, I perform the, the, the frozen elephant rank. Uh, the, the older patient that I have operated have uh, 83 years old. It's patient with good condition and uh, made the bender procedure also the elephant and the frozen elephant rank. I have one thing to to this to Jörg uh, about the um, about the don't use the the guide wire in Toraflex. It's important to use every in every patients in chronic and acute and chronic dissection actually. In dissection, before it's important to put the stiff guide, the stiff guide wire in the true lumen, uh, because if you put uh, the, the 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 device in a true lumen without the guide wire, uh, it's possible to enter in uh, in the additional uh, reentry and. Uh, uh, put the, the, the device in the, in the false lumen. I have had one patient, my first patient in chronic dissections, is Marfan patient, a woman. I put the, the Avita in the, in the true lumen, but the deployment uh, became in the false lumen. Also, it's important to use the, the guide wire also in chronic aneurysm. Because if it's a big aneurysm, it's possible to have this situation when you enter in aneurysm, have the, 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 the device uh, put the curvature, and when you deploy it, uh, don't enter in the, in the lumen mm -hmm. of the aorta. Can I, um, thanks for the, th uh, thanks for that. I mean, so far the uh, uh, the uh, implants that we've done with the uh, with Soraflex has been only uh, aneurysms, and luckily, with not so tortuous uh, distal aorta. But uh, I, I take that, uh, uh, that point, and, and thanks for that advice. Can I ask, in Marfan patients, would you also use? a hybrid technique 
I thought it was asked that now, what to do with, with yes. the young Marfans if, uh, if a stent is uh, uh, advisable to be used or, or, or we should use the uh, classic sure. technique? I have, no, no, I have used also the, the, the hybrid technique. In the recent, my experience, the last one year, when the patient, generally also the Marfan patient, they arrive with the big aneurysm of uh, descending abdominal aorta. And in this patient, we have used this technique before I made the, the frozen elephant trunk. Then we insert uh, another one or two endoprosthesis uh, from the femoral artery naturally using the the um, the, the evita uh, with the landing zone the proximal landing zone and i put this prosthesis until to uh, the first the first uh, um, abdominal artery okay. and then we made the reimplantation of the this the, of the abdominal aorta and the reimplantation of the four visceral arteries before, and then after two weeks, I complete the endoprosthesis from the descent to abdominal aorta. Okay. okay. In ten cases, without, without until now, uh, complication. Thanks. <clears throat> um, okay. <laughs> I, I I have two questions. Uh, for Dr. Di Bartolomeo. Now, my first question is, when you have a chronic type B dissection, quite often you have actually half of the organs being perfused by one lumen and some other organs by the other lumen. So, how do, what's your policy in this case? How do you put actually a standard descending order? How do you choose which lumen? Or you do other tricks that just to do fenestrations more distally and just stabilize a part of the order. In the <coughs> chronic type B dissection, I have uh, uh, experience with uh, two, uh, two special patients. One is a patient with chronic type B dissection and aneurysm of arch or ascending aorta. And in two, three cases, three cases, I don't remember, the acute type B dissection, in whom the patient, a very, very small uh, true lumen. I have inserted the evita, and we have seen after the operation the expansions of the true lumen and the reduction of the, the symptoms. This patient have an abdominal angina. And, um, in this, in all in all cases, when there is the indication to extend the the prosthesis, the endoprosthesis, we made the without a problem until the visceral arterias. Also in the chronic diabetes dissection. Grant, thank you, thank you very much. The, my second question before we come back, to you, I'm sorry about this. Is that you see the commonest thing we see is type A dissection, acute type A dissection, which starts actually from the aortic valve, includes you know, everything goes into the coronaries, ascending, arch, descending into the abdominal aorta, and the patient is coming three o'clock in the morning. And most of us actually feel actually that we have actually just to sort out the root, uh, possibly doing a bental, and leave actually the rest at a later stage. The way you describe things is that actually you, I, I saw quite a few slides there, actually bental plus, so you go actually do the full mount, going actually just putting actually deploying the standard descending aorta, doing the arts, doing bental wheel implants of coronaries. Uh, definitely, this is actually a massive operation. Uh, it, it is more logical to go, go and just do the root and the ascending aorta and leave the rest for for a later stage. Uh, I have one concept. Uh, the majority of the dissection start in ascending aorta, no? 70% of the cases you have the, the dissection in ascending aorta. Only 20, 30% in descending. When the patient 
have the dissection in the sending aorta is uh, probably this patient made the dissection also in ascending aorta. If you put uh, the majority of the surgeon now, when there is uh, uh, acute that be dissection, in the, there is the 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 the, um, the, the uh, enlargement of the aorta. They put the stent, no, in the in the descending aorta, and sometimes you have the retrograde dissection. I think uh, for the, in the future, it's better to introduce the indication to made in acute type B dissection to indicate to made the uh, frozen elephant trunk and made the contemporary reimplantation of the ascending and the arch. The last uh, week, Wednesday, I made one patient, uh, 49 years old, that have uh, 10 days ago a acute diabetes dissection, and the patient have uh, also an aneurysm, 5.6 uh, uh, centimeter of ascending aorta aneurysm. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I made the bender procedure, arch replacement, and uh, frozen elephant trunk. But I think for the future, it's better to introduce, in this case, when there is the type B dissection, to make also uh, the, the frozen elephant drink. Thank you. Can, yeah. Is this gentleman down yeah. there? Just to, to come, to, to, <coughs> to add, to, to, yeah, yeah, to add, add to, the, to, to, the, uh, uh, to the answer. I think one of the, one of the, one of the uh, issues is that we don't know exactly what happens with the uh, with the distal uh, false lumen, and we don't know if there are more re-entry points. Uh, and in a couple of occasions, I have uh, operated on type A dissections with extensions into the arch, and where, where not just the flap was extended into the arch, but the tear was extended into the arch and partly into the uh, proximal descending aorta. Um, and those patients, uh, probably the only way to treat them is, is with a frozen trunk. And in none of them, in two occasions, I know it's, it's, very, it's very few, um, we have never seen any visceral ischemia or, 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 or anything. So it may be that there is further re-entry points uh, that we don't know about. Come on. Sorry. Yeah, it Sorry. is just a quick question to Dr. Di Bartolomeo and Mascaro. Um, how do you choose the size of your stent graft with regards to uh, di diameter and length to avoid endoleaks and spinal cord injury? And do you find the current uh, arrangement of, um, of um, diameter to length quite limiting to certain types of patients? Increase of uh, acute on chronic dissection. Uh, you know the, the, the size of Evita? Start from 24, 28, 30, 33, 36, 40. And uh, uh, Toraflex start from 28, 30, 32, 36, 40. And uh, uh, generally I use 24 or 28, not more. In the first part of my experience I have used also 30 <coughs> and 33. But with the experience of the register of Evita, is better to use 24 and 28 because in this, in the in case of uh, spinal cord um, lesion, uh, this occurred in patient when where uh, where was used the bigger uh, sides of endoprosthesis. Uh, first and the second. Uh, in the aneurysm, in the chronic aneurysm, is important to know the diameter, the, the aorta after the aneurysm. And then in this case, is, uh, is important to make the oversizing 10, 15 percent. In the chron in acute and chronic dissection, no.
Thank you. Uh, there's a question to Rizwan. Uh, Rizwan, that was a fantastic talk showing us the future of uh, aortic imaging. There was a recent paper from a Japanese group which looked at uh, cadaveric specimens of patients who had aortic dissections. And what they found was that there was a, a paucity or depletion of vasovasorum, in the, and most of the dissections were in the outer third of the aortic wall, indicating an ischemic origin of the dissections. <coughs> Considering your, most of your metabolic imaging has got a resolution of five millimeters, I guess we've got a while to go. At this point, can you tell us, is there a transmural difference in the signaling or in the metabolic signature? Is there a transmural difference? Because at the moment, you're looking at regional differences across the whole aneurysm. But is there a transmural difference? I guess you need a very high resolution imaging for that. But it indicates that the dissection is because of ischemia starting from the outside for the lack of vasovasorum. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I think we can't say using um, metabolic imaging because it just won't have the spatial resolution. Um, it's not the radio trace, it's the mode of acquisition with, uh, uh, with it. The only way we'll be able to tell that is with um, magnetic resonance imaging because you can increase the field strength of the magnet and it will give you um, areas of high metabolic uptake with a fused uh, PET MR imaging. Um, the other thing to say is that aneurysmal disease is, is, a, is a spectrum of disease, and it depends where you look, up, look at it along that spectrum. So what we're looking at is advanced end-stage aortic wall. We know that patients who dissect necessarily don't have a dilated aorta at the time they're dissecting. So I think there's a different disease process ongoing in aortic dissection versus aortic aneurysms. Um, and I think we don't understand what's happening in the aortic wall at the site of dissection, apart from the wall shear stress hemodynamics. But I think it'll be a tricky one to separate out. That's right, yeah. Thank you. Does anyone else have any Can I? I have one. Dr. Atia, I, I enjoy your, your, your presentation very much, and I think that uh, you just uh, presented the, uh, uh, the area where we should be looking at uh, to, to uh, uh, prevent further ruptures and, and so on. With regard to the pulse wave uh, velocity, have you... Did you find sort of an inflection point like the Eleftheria, there's an a, a inflection point in, 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 in size, whereby you will say, well, beyond this uh, velocity, we should monitor patients closer, or so on? Yeah, that's a good point you raised. Um, it was actually along a continuous level. So every one meter per second increase you tend to get in the pulse velocity seems to correlate to a higher and higher risk of uh, aneurysm expansion. So it's a linear? It's a linear it's a, relationship. It's a, it's a, it's a linear, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, if there are no other questions, it just remains me to thank you for coming for this lunchbox session. Thank all our speakers, and, and hope you enjoy the afternoon. Mm -hmm.